Looks like we're live. Okay, we're live now. <laughs> well, good afternoon here in Oxford. Uh, welcome to like we're live. Primate Conversations. Okay, we're live now. I'm hearing some echo here, so let me just well, try to... Good afternoon it. here in Oxford. Uh, welcome to... Like we're live. Okay. That happens sometimes. Back to the back to primary conversations. Good afternoon. Um, welcome to primary conversations. My name is Rene uh, Bobe, and uh, we're delighted to have Carol Ward with us uh, today for this week's version of uh, primary conversations. Uh, Carol is a distinguished professor and director of anatomical sciences in the School of Medicine at the University University of Missouri, uh, Columbia. I think that's where she is at the moment. Yeah. Um, Carol holds a PhD in uh, functional anatomy and evolution from Johns Hopkins University, where she did uh, her first work on Miocene apes, I understand, uh, proconsul and uh, some of those marvelous Kenyan specimens. And uh, for the past, uh, should I say, three decades, uh, Carol has been publishing <laughs> consistently and extensively on uh, the, the functional anatomy and description of uh, various fossils uh, from, from the Miocene, but also hominins from the Pleistocene. Uh, she has a long record of publications uh, that, that also include a, a few uh, volumes, uh, just to highlight a couple of them. There's a, a, a book on function, phylogeny and fossils from 1997 on Miocene hominoids and great ape uh, and human origins. It's a wonderful book, um, it's still, current after, uh, even though it's been a few years since publication. Uh, also result of uh, extensive work in Canapoi that uh, Carol carried, uh, has carried out for many years in, in which I was uh, fortunate to have participated. She recently published uh, a, a special issue in the Journal of Human Evolution on Canapoi, uh, the paleobiology uh, of a Pliocene site in, in Kenya. Um, and Carol will talk to us about the, the, the shape of human origins. And uh, for those of you listening to us uh, on YouTube, please, uh, if you have questions that you would like to ask Carol, if you can post them in the chat uh, function there in YouTube, we will get to them at the end of this talk. So Carol, welcome. It's a real pleasure to have you here. And we're looking forward to hearing your talk. Thanks so much, Renee. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, this has a really been a wonderful series. I've had a chance to watch at least, I think probably most of the presentations and I'm very honored to be part of this. I will say that for those of you who may have heard um, Sergio Almetica's talk at the beginning of the series, some of the themes in this are gonna be fairly similar because as I'm gonna to suggest to you, I think the evidence about our origins of our clade have been changing over recent years and we're getting some new perspectives on how and why hominins evolved. So I hope you can all see my screen. Um, I'd like to thank you again for spending the time to listen to this. I'm, as a paleoanthropologist, I'm interested in the beginning of the hominin story. To me, all good stories begin at the beginning. And that means understanding the nature of the earliest members of our branch of the family tree, if you will, here exemplified by the poster child for human evolution, Lucy. If we understand something about what these ancestors are like, and we can understand where they came from, we get a really good idea about the origins of our lineage and the adaptations that led to the development of later hominins, such as this Homo erectus, and of course, eventually us. So the beginning of the story is a good place to start. Now, I think everybody has seen this image. If you don't have a picture hanging up next to your desk or a poster with a parody of this, I'll be somewhat surprised. I think we all do. But this is the classic view of human evolution published by Time Life in the late, really early 70s. And at this time, we thought you can see here depicted the sort of basic chimpanzee-like creature, knuckle walking slowly by the time you get to Australopithecus standing up, sort of hunched forward and becoming more upright and eventually turning into Homo sapiens. But this picture, of course, was done a long time ago before a lot of the fossils that we have today have been recovered. And you probably can get the idea that I think that this is perhaps incorrect, or it is certainly incorrect. We now know, of course, there are multiple lineages, 
But basically the progression of changes and how we stand and move is really probably fairly different from what this depicts. So what I'd like to do is go through today and talk a little bit about some of this evidence and some of my work and how other work of others and how this all feeds together. Now this image wasn't really born of any idea that came from the fossil record. Instead, this really stems from comparative anatomy. If you go out in the world today, you can see that there are a number of different primates um, out there in the world and there's lots of different apes and all of them except one are broadly similar sorts of creatures. They tend to spend most of their time or a significant amount of their time in the trees. They tend to be ripe fruit specialists occupying terminal branch niches and climbing in trees. They all have long arms, long fingers, short backs, short lower limbs. So they're all pretty similar. And if you look at all of these animals and you apply a principle of parsimony, you'll see that all of these except for one oddball lineage is very similar. And so it seems parsimonious to assume that the common ancestor of apes and humans would have been something like one of the modern great apes. And they all have their different flavors and there's a lot of differences among them. But the basic pattern seems to be what you would imagine would have characterized our ancestors. And the arboreal specializations that the modern apes have mean that when they come to the ground, they have to move in a fairly different way from a lot of other animals. Their backs are very stiff. It's harder for them to stand up fluidly and put a curve in their lower back like we do. So when on the ground, the great apes tend to use their fists or knuckles to move quadrupedally. Pilobatids, of course, have done their own thing and just walk on two feet in a different way. But this is the idea of what it would seem to be if all we had to do was look at modern animals. But of course we have a fossil record and the fossil record of hominoids is actually quite extensive. We know that by the time of Australopiths, we have these committed bipedal ancestors that are very clearly basically similar to us in a lot of ways in terms of posture and locomotion. We have some slightly earlier, very latest Miocene apes that seem to be at least maybe partly bipedal and completely, um, but still not quite like extant apes in all ways. We know that the very earliest hominoids, and there are a whole bunch of them, were much more primitive. They were above branch quadrupeds, and they all have their own sort of ecological takes on making their way through the world. And even up through the middle Miocene, and I'm playing a little loose with phylogeny here, if you can see my mouse, um, somewhere near the origin of the great ape and human clade, we have a series of apes, none of which has this extensive arboreal build and likely adaptations that we see in the extant apes. We even have one taxon associated with Pongo that is still probably a basically mostly above branch quadrupedal animal. And it only isn't till towards the middle later Miocene where we start to see animals that are probably somewhere close to the African and ape and human clade, depending on how you slice your phylogeny. And these are where you start to see animals that look like below branch orthograde um, climbers, sort of like we see in extant apes but not all of them are exactly like we see in the modern animals. And this is really significant. So what I'd like to do today is talk a little bit about of my work on the Australopiths. And I'd like to talk about a little bit of my work coming from these later radiation of Miocene apes and show you some evidence that I think may change some of our ideas about what the common ancestor of apes and humans might've been like and what that might mean for hominid origins. And I'm gonna to talk to you today about body shape. We tend to look at animals and we, when we think about locomotion, which is clearly a key driver of the diversity that we see in modern apes, we tend to think of limbs, hands, hips, pelvises, but in fact, the shape of the torso is really closely linked to locomotor behavior and specialization and extant primates. So if you look at this gorilla compared to this human, you can see some really key differences. Certainly we have the longer lower limbs, the shorter upper limbs and so forth, but you also see that the gorilla has a very long pelvis, a very, very short lumbar region so that the ribs nearly reach the pelvis itself. And the shape of the rib cage is quite different with the gorilla being more cone shaped, the human being more barrel shaped. And these differences are in fact linked to locomotor specialization. The short, very stiff body shape of a gorilla like the other great apes provides a very stable platform for the upper limb muscles that are used when moving around in the trees in a below branch orthograde way. 
provides a very stiff and stable platform. However, when this gorilla comes down to the ground, its back is so stiff, it can't put sort of a lodosis or curve in its lower back and stand upright. It's got these large, heavy upper limbs and the gorillas will tend to knuckle walk when they're on the ground. Humans, on the other hand, with a short pelvis, long flexible spine, are able to produce the subtle movements of twisting and rotation in the lower back and pelvis that gives us that very fluid, smooth, even bipedal gait of modern humans. And the lower back, pelvis, and torso are a critical part of this. So these should be parts of the body that we could look at for clues about how our fossil relatives may have made their way through the world. So if you get to a introductory anthropology textbook, you open it up, you may very well see a figure like this looking at torso shape. We could see the chimp just like a gorilla with a long pelvis and the short lower back, human short pelvis, long flexible back. And here's Australopithecus with a short, fairly human-like pelvis, not a lot of information in the lower back, but this very ape-like cone-shaped rib cage. Now you'll notice that the dates that this reconstruction was made were a long time ago, and we've had a lot more fossil evidence come in since then. But if you look at this original reconstruction and you kind of use your mind's eye to imagine fitting soft tissues around this frame, you end up with a body shape that looks fairly much like something like this gorilla. And this body shape and this reconstruction have been really influential in, for example, inferring gut size from primates, Gorilla has a large gut for has hind gut fermentation for eating plant foods. And the idea is that maybe gut size was associated with bipedality. There have been a whole host of scenarios and hypotheses that have been predicated upon this reconstruction. However, like I say, we have a lot more fossils now. In fact, we have skeleton, partial skeletons from multiple species of Australopiths in the earlier part of our lineage. And a lot of these have vertebrae, ribs, and bits of pelvis information on this torso that we can look at to examine this hypothesis about how great ape-like, in fact, Australopiths might have been built. Now, this is a fairly old part of the story. We know that humans have this series of sinusoidal curvatures that pull our center of mass up over our supporting limbs when we're standing upright, very efficient me mechanism of balance compared with an ape that has a more uniform, typical mammalian arc to this vertebral column. We have a number of different spines of Australopiths and every single one of them shows all the anatomies that we associate with the presence of lumbar curvatures. So we already know that that hunched over idea from our time life drawing about Australopiths and how they would have moved is incorrect. But there's actually some more evidence now that we can add to this. Um, this is a picture of a skeleton called STS-14. It was the first Australopith skeleton discovered. It was published in the early 70s by John Robinson. And this is Robert Broom, the discoverer, holding the block of breccia from the cave in Sturkfontein. And you can see this is the before and after version of STS-14. And this is, skeleton has been really influential in understanding the vertebral column morphology in Australopiths. But there are also a lot of fragments that came out of this breccia block. And a couple of years ago, I was able to find evidence of at least a little bit of up to the lower nine ribs of STS-14. And there's actually a little bit of information in these very fragmentary fossils. So if you look at the torso, the ribs articulate with the thoracic vertebrae. And if you take a bird's eye view and look at these, what you see is that each rib articulates with the head, the head of the rib articulates with the vertebral body and the transverse process or near the angle of the rib here articulates with the transverse process. So we have a costovertebral and costotransverse articulation. And this in the chimpanzee, which is shown here, extends all the way down the rib cage. And if we look at the ribs, the last rib, the second to last and third to last ribs, on the chimp, we see large articular facets for where they would have attached to the transverse processes. It's a very tight binding of the rib to the vertebra. If you look at humans on the other hand, our last two ribs are floating ribs. They articulate with the vertebral body, but not with the transverse processes. And they're small. And this means they have just that much little bit of mobility so that their rib cage isn't tightly affixed to the vertebral column near the lower part, which probably contributes to our ability to swivel our waist in that subtle motion when we walk. We've known that Lucy 
AL288-1, Afarensis, has a large articular facet on probably one of its lower ribs, but there's at least one rib that's pretty large, but there's no evidence for a strong articulation here with the transverse process. And now we can add STS-14 to this. We have the last two ribs and there's no evidence of vertebral articulation here. So this is likely to do with mobility at the waist or moving slightly during locomotion, but whichever it is, it's very clear that Australopith's lower ribs were not as tightly applied to their vertebral column as we might see in a modern grade ape. And this is the same for all modern grade apes. So that's a little bit more human-like too. There've also been some publications of some more complete ribs in the fossil record belonging to Afarensis and Sediba, two Australopithecus species. And you can measure rib curvature really any way you want. This is the one that Haile Selassie and colleagues had, had published. And if you look at the curvature of the ribs one down through seven, what you see is humans have much more curved ribs than do apes up in the upper part of the vertebral, uh, upper part of the rib cage, and they're more similar a bit lower down. And this matches the overall shape of the rib cage with this wide upper portion that we see in humans compared to this more triangular outline that we see in the chimps. And so this is all true for all the living African apes. They all have less rib curvature up high. And so this could be because they're arboreal, setting up the scapula for reaching their arms over their head. It could be some relation to torso shape, which may or may not be locomotion. But we put our australopiths on here and sure enough, they look pretty human-like. Now. What does this say about locomotion? Well, it's unlikely to reflect anything about arboreality or lack thereof, because gibbons and siamangs, who are pretty good arboreal-lists, also have broad upper rib cages, and which you can see here. So this seems to indicate a very human-like torso shape, regardless of what's going on, not probably knuckle walking or something like that, but it has to do with torso shape. And the determinants of that are not entirely clear, but not only is the vertebral column fairly similar, the rib cage shape is likely fairly similar in a human and an australopith as well. Now, we shouldn't be super surprised that torso shape and upper limb function are not very closely coupled. This is a recently published figure of a series of scapulae here. And we saw that the rib cage shape, for example, in humans, shown here in blue, and gibbons way over here on the far right side, have fairly similar thorax shapes, but the scapulae are very different. Gibbons look much more like a chimpanzee with a long, narrow scapula, a more superiorly um, oriented glenoid fossa. So torso shape doesn't seem to have to do with climbing, per se, at least not on its own. So this has to do with body shape for perhaps some other reason. So if we imagine what Australopithecus may have looked like, rather than having that chimp-like rib cage, it may have looked something more like our reconstruction here in the middle, which is fairly like a short, stocky, mostly human-like shape of its body. So much more modern than you would imagine from just hypothesizing what we might have looked like based on looking at modern apes. So when we go back to our time-life diagram, we can pretty much X this part off. This is um, not necessarily correct based on what we know. The earliest bipeds, at least Australopith committed bipeds, would have been fully upright and moved largely like we do. But what about what came before Australopiths? After all, natural selection can only act on last year's model. And if we wanna understand how and why we became committed terrestrial bipeds, we need to know the starting point for where we would have come from. And those of you who watched Sergio's talks a few weeks ago um, got also some additional information on this transition that I think dovetails quite nicely with what I'm gonna show you today. So again, I'm gonna be looking at body shape. Anthropoid primates, have some of the most diverse array of locomotor specializations of any mammalian clade. We have committed terrestrial bipeds. We have flexible quadrumanus arboreal animals that move upright. We have animals that move in the trees quadrupedally, terrestrial quadrupeds. We even have animals with long prehensile tails, animals with no tails at all. And all of these are related to torso shape, which anchors all of these muscles and um, forms the body shape on which these limbs are moving. Also, if we look at the pelvis in particular, these, this is going to anchor the lower limb muscles, just like we were looking at the upper limb muscles and the rib cage. The pelvis is also an anchor for the lower limb muscles and indicator hip joint function and posture. So it's a really useful part of body to look at. And I'm going to take a time now and focus more on the pelvis side of the equation for the next few slides. <laughs> 
So what do we know about variation in primate torso shape? We know that it's really variable and until fairly recently, this is the sum total of information really that's published about comparative primate torso shape. And these are, these are um, diagrams that go back to Schultz and Arison in the 50s and 60s. And so what we wanted to do is see if we could expand on this. So we went and we CT'd a whole bunch of primate cadavers, and then we're able to use CT technology to identify and segment out all the bones. And what this shows us is that if you have a pen and a pencil and a good eye, you can probably do just about as good a job as you can with fancy technology. But it also shows that they were pretty much right. And the variation we hypothesized is in fact there. We were also though able to extend our investigations, include a lot more taxa. We have even more than you see here and get an appreciation for the variation in the whole parts of the torso, which I won't talk about all of today, um, but this is really useful to see how all these bits fit together. So the idea of torso shape being related to locomotion is not new. You could see these diagrams back to Schultz in 1930 had the idea of this. And if you compare say monkeys who are, tend to be quadrupedal with apes who tend to be orthograde climbers, what you see is the rib cage shape is fairly different. So that the narrow rib cage of a monkey is much more like that of a typical quadrupedal mammal in which the shoulder joint or glenoid fossa of the scapula is facing ventrally. And this enables it to withstand the loads from quadrupedal locomotion and moves its limbs primarily or specialized to move its limbs in a sagittal fashion as you do when you're quadrupedal. Apes, on the other hand, Schultz noted, have a much broader upper rib cage, or so he interpreted, and he interpreted this to be, an, be able to, or as a uh, mechanism to reorient those shoulder joints and the muscles that run between the shoulder joints and the humerus, so that they're running much more in a medial lateral direction, which would be much better for line of action for using those climbing muscles to pull yourself around with your upper limbs when you're in the trees. And if we look at our CT data, these are two torsos here. You can see that they basically seem to suggest that Schultz was onto something. You can see what looks like a broader, flatter rib cage here in the ape compared to the monkey. And in orange here, I've highlighted the iliac crest of the pelvis. You can see that the pelvis seems to mirror this rib cage shape, being more sort of vertical, if you will, in the monkey and more transversely oriented in the ape. And this has been, this idea has been dogma, if you will, for a long time. My dissertation research was largely predicated upon some of these assumptions, but we're getting a little bit more sophisticated understanding of how this works now. Um, one thing that we can see is if you take these torsos and you measure rib cage breadth, what you see is we have apes in purple circles here and monkeys in blue triangles, not much difference at the first rib. Apes are a little broader at ribs three through seven. But by the time you get to the lower part of the rib cage, they don't have a very broader, much broader rib cage overall. By the lower part of the rib cage, they look every bit like monkeys. So this idea of this broad thorax is not completely accurate, maybe a little bit, but not very much. The difference, in fact, is that not that apes have a broader rib cage, they have an actual shorter rib cage. So you can measure this any number of ways, but basically if you look at the height of the rib cage divided by pick your favorite measure of size, you can see apes have much shorter torsos compared with most monkeys and humans actually are a little bit longer than monkey like too. So apes here seem to be the fairly odd ones out. And in fact, if you look at apes just with your camera, you can see the long flexible spines and long narrow bodies of our running monkeys here compared to the very short torso that you see in the orangutans. So it's really not so much a broadening of the rib cage in apes, it's a shortening of the rib cage in apes. And we also shouldn't be surprised that this may or may not be due to suspensory locomotion. Um, Lab Ki Chan was able to show that in terms of shoulder mobility and ranges of motion, apes and monkeys really aren't very different after all, despite having very different torso shapes. So these differences can't really be explained by shoulder mobility or shoulder posture. In fact, I think it's something else. So if we take a look at the pelvis here and we look at the breadth of the ilium, so the upper part of the pelvis, which is about the widest point in a torso, and we compare um, various different hominoids. You can see humans have, um, humans have weird pelvises. I'm not gonna talk about them here, but apes have maybe a little bit wider pelvis than monkeys, but the body shape isn't very much wider, just like we saw in the rib cage. 
In fact, the difference in that apparent wide iliac blade of apes that people have talked about is not so much that the outside of the pelvis is wider, but the sacrum is relatively narrow. So the posterior portions of the pelvis are closer together, the sacrum is narrower, and that's where the real difference between apes and monkey lies. So what's going on between those parts of the pelvis? Well, that's where the erector spiny musculature starts, the muscles that all run up and down on either side of your vertebral column, which support and maintain that upright posture. And if you look at apes versus monkeys, this is a diagram from on Lovejoy's 2005 paper in Gait and Posture. You can see this is an ape over here in tan on the left with a smaller erector spiny muscle mass. This is just a cross section compared to the much larger one we see at the monkeys, which is probably associated with having that longer torso and moving it throughout locomotion where apes have that short stiff torso. There's not much muscle because there's no movement there. So the differences in iliac blade morphology and pelvic morphology that we've talked about by looking at just one hip bone or another really reflects differences in spinal musculature, not thorax, not wide thoraxes, not shoulder rearrangements or anything going on with the upper limbs. So if you look, go back to our torso pictures here, um, what you see, if you measure iliac orientation, the upper part of the pelvis, yeah, you see apes here have much wider or much more coronally oriented um, iliac blades than do monkeys, and there seems to be a difference. But if you measure just this lateral portion of the pelvis that we call the iliac plane, it's actually in the same orientation in everybody. So what accounts for this apparent discrepancy in pelvic orientation? Well, it turns out that this back part of the pelvis here, this is where that erector spiny muscle mass originates on the pelvis. It's much smaller than apes, and it's much closer to the midline, which means that the iliac portion of the pelvis is much broader. And so the overall orientation is actually affected by this geometric change. So there's no rotation of the iliac blade. There's just a change in geometry associated with shrinking or you know, reduced vertebral musculature. And in fact, if you look um, in a bird's eye view of this, this is from a paper that Emily Middleton and I published a few years ago. If you shrink the size of the, of the erector spiny origin, pull it towards the center, it just changes the overall geometry that we measure for pelvises. So really these torso differences are more about spinal flexibility and the associated musculature than they are to do with um, upper limb function. And there's the muscle mass on top of that. So what does this mean for the fossil record? I'm gonna take a minute and talk about this particular Miocene ape. This is called Rudopithecus hungaris, hungaricus. They begun in Las Acordos, discovered these, um, or have, were working at Rudabanya, the site in Hungary, and discovered a pelvis of this ape, um, which is really significant. Pelvises are fragmentary. We don't have a lot of them in the fossil record. So this was a pretty cool fossil to find. If it does tell us about body shape, if it does tell us about lower limb function, the, the pelvis is able to tell us a lot. And the other reason Rudopithecus is important is it's fairly recent. It's only 10 million years old, and it's probably close to the African ape and human clade. Different people put it slightly one side or the other of different branch points, but basically this is fairly closely related to the African ape and human clade, perhaps as a sister taxon. And so it's significant for understanding um, uh, body posture and locomotion. Um, and we can compare these to our different torsos that we were looking at in the, um, the previous pictures and see what the pelvis might tell us about body shape in particular of this ape. And it tells us a pretty interesting story, I think. So let me give you some examples of some of the morphology and what it tells us. Again, like I mentioned with the monkeys, they're above branch quadrupeds. They move their limbs very sagittally. They have long flexible spines and narrow, or not narrow, but long flexible um, torsos. Whereas apes, they hold their bodies orthograde or in a vertical posture. They use all four limbs to move around and support their weight in these terminal branch habits where the fruit happens to be that they're specialized for. And this involves quite a bit of limb flexibility. You can see the abducted posture of the, of the limb in the siamang here. So the, we should be able to see something in hip joints as well as indications of torso form that might be able to tell us whether Rudopithecus was like one of these earlier apes or monkeys or whether it's like one of the more modern ones. And in fact, you can use the hip joint shape of the acetabulum to get a hint at this. 
in orthograde animals and apes, we see an expansion of the cranial portion of the, of the lunate surface to reflect loading and orthograde posture, whereas monkeys have a very even distribution of the joint surface. Rutopithecus, Rutopithecus looks just like an extant ape, and it's expanded, so we can hypothesize that it would have been orthograde as well. Ashley Hammond in 2016 published a paper where she was able to take hip bones and digitally articulate the femur and using some soft tissue constraints, um, look at the range of motion. And she was able to show from sort of a neutral, if you will, to abducted posture in purple here that Rutopithecus range of motion would have been great, capable of much greater abduction than we see in a typical monkey. And instead is much more similar to what we see in our Siamang here. So we think that this reconstruction you see of Rutopithecus is probably not too accurate, an orthograde animal that would have been an acrobatic climber, climber in the trees. So what about the pelvis? Does the pelvis morphology look like an ape? Well, we can measure, for example, how widely flaring those iliac blades are, and you can plot that out. And what you see, these are apes down here. Rutopithecus looks just like ape with a much more flaring ilium than we tend to see in monkeys or an Ekembo and Sheetopithecus, which are early and earlier middle Miocene apes, so which are much more monkey-like. We can also look at the orientation, overall orientation of the iliac blade, and we can see here are apes with that apparently flaring, more coronal overall orientation. Here's, these are um, semi-suspensory Atelier monkeys, and Rutopithecus has fairly um, coronally oriented iliac blades in the part that it has preserved, which is also different from the much more monkey-like configuration we see in Ekembo and Shivapithecus. And Hylobates is a little bit different, but that's sort of a story for another day. So it's looking pretty ape-like, but what's not like a modern ape, and what really struck us when we looked at this fossil, was the fact that the ilium is just not long. That gorilla, the chimp I've shown you, all have these really long ilia, which are showed you, associated with really short lumbar spines. When we look at great apes up here in blue, they have super long ilia, hylobatids and to some extent atellines have slightly longer ilia than do most monkeys. And here's Rutopithecus. It's short like Ikembo, which we used to call proconsul, and maybe even a little bit shorter than what we see in the pongin Shivapithecus. So this doesn't seem to fit with our model of how you build an ape torso. So what's going on here? Well, Let's take a look for a moment at the hip bones and the torsos together. Over on the left are monkeys. You see a very short pelvis, long lumbar spine. And you see that hip bones here are narrow. They're very fitting this, this body shape. When we look over here on hand, other hand at great apes, we see this very long pelvis that have widely flaring iliac blades because of this narrow sacrum. However, if we put gibbons and siamangs on here, we see that they're a little bit intermediate. The pelvis is a little bit longer, the lower back is a little bit shorter. And overall, when we look at our Rutopithecus pelvis here, we in fact, it matches quite well the morphology that we see in a siamang. So it's not really ape-like, or not really great ape-like, it's not really monkey-like, it seems to be in between. But rather than hypothesizing that the locomotor behavior was sort of suspensory and sort of quadrupedal because the vertebral and pelvic morphologies are kind of in between, we need to remember the lesser apes, which are also kind of in between, but still highly specialized orthograde arboreal acrobatic animals. So what's explaining this? Well, it turns out body size. Body size is a huge part of this. Going from a, from a gibbon, which is a, um, sort of cocker spaniel sized, all the way up to 400 pound gorillas and, and, and uh, orang large male orangutans, we see an incredible increase in body mass and we see strongly positively allometric changes in pelvic length and in iliac width and all of these adaptations I've been talking about in great apes. So gibbons and siamangs can get away with a fairly similar orthograde climbing behavior, but with a much less specialized body shape just because they're not, they're smaller. The larger you get, the more the mechanical consequences that you have to manage to inhabit an arboreal niche become exponentially greater. So how big was Rutopithecus? Rutopithecus was bigger than a siamang probably, 
but not quite as large as say a bonobo or a small chimpanzee. And in fact, its pelvic morphology for what we have preserved fits exactly where you'd expect for a homin an modern ape of its size. So here's an animal that may have been able to move in the trees is efficiently or even more so than modern great apes. It just didn't have that extreme body build because it wasn't nearly as large. And in fact, most Miocene apes were not as large as chimps, gorillas, or orangutans. They all are very, many of them, the larger ones tend to be very similar in size to Rudapithecus. So it may be this is extreme torso adaptation is somewhat unique to great apes by being so large and dependent on moving about in the trees. So if we go back to our cladogram here, we have all of our hominoids up at the top. We have um, our above branch, quadrupedal, tailless, early Miocene apes. We see similar morphology up through the middle Miocene in all likelihood. And then we have the series of apes that may be orthograde climbers, but just not morphologically specialized somewhere near the origin of African apes and humans. And then of course, when we get to the very earliest hominins, this is Artipithecus, they're not quite chimp or gorilla-like in all ways either. And all of this suggests that perhaps we need to rethink our hypothesis about what the last common ancestor of apes and humans may have been like in terms of its body build and locomotor profile. So when we look at these extreme adapted large grade apes, they give us an idea that this is what the ancestor might be like, but in fact, some of these Miocene apes, these are various reconstructions, might make a better model, at least in terms of body shape, for what a common ancestor may have been like. There are a lot of these different apes and all the directions seem to point to a fairly similar um, interpretation to what we're getting from torsos. So when we go back to our time life drawing, we had this hypothesis of a chimp-like ancestor leading to Australopiths. We've seen that Australopiths weren't particularly intermediate in body form between apes and monkeys at all. In fact, in some ways, they're much more primitive. And we've seen that some of these Miocene apes weren't as specialized as great apes. But imagine if we hypothesize that the last common ancestor of chimps and humans, at least in terms of its locomotor profile, or specialization and body form, maybe it was more like Rudapithecus or some of these later Miocene apes. And chimps and gorillas would have become specialized as they became large and specialized for that arboreal niche. Whereas the hominin ancestors, as the forests began to cool, or the world began to cool and the forests began to spread out, and the way of may come down to the ground and move just like they moved in the trees upright, which they would have been able to do with this more generalized body build than what we see in African apes and humans. So I would suggest to you that at least this should raise the possibility in our minds that we need to stop answering the old question the time life diagram asked, which was, why did we stand up from all fours? That's the question that's in all the textbooks and we always talk about. But I think the new Miocene fossil evidence suggests that in fact, we might be, answering, be better off asking the question, why did our ancestors never drop down on all fours to begin with? And that's a fundamentally different way of thinking about human evolution and hominin origins and the origins of bipedal locomotion. We don't have quite a smoking gun yet, but especially those of you who saw Sergio's talk realize that if we take a look at the diversity of apes that live that may not be around today, we get a really fairly different picture and it's really may change our ideas and our hypotheses of how and why bipedality began. And since bipedality was sort of the hallmark of our lineage and the real key change, um, this is a really fundamentally new way to think about human evolution. I think it's starting to start asking some new questions. And I'll just spend another couple minutes tying this with diet, because we've always hypothesized that as the savannas expanded and the forest shrank, hominids struck out across the open savanna. They had this, this incredible, powerful chewing adaptation to eat whatever they found when they got there. And bipedality was a way for them to get out and find these different food sources. And when we look at Australopiths, certainly by Afarensis, we see the large posterior teeth and small anterior teeth. We see the huge chewing adaptation and they're bipedal. So this all makes sense. But if you look a little bit back further in time, you change your mind a little bit. Um, this is just a bit of a gratuitous plug um, for my um, our field research project called the West Arcana Paleo Project. 
which I co-organize with um, Frederick Talamanthi of the National Museums of Kenya and Mike Plovkin from Arkansas. And I think probably in the bottom right, you might recommend um, Dr. Bobe here, who's on our team as well. Um, we are working at other sites, but we spend a lot of time, as Renee mentioned, working at Canapoy, which is a site up in West Turkana. Um, it's where Meve Leakey and her team identified the new species of Australopithecus anamensis in the 90s. And we know that this is one of the earliest Australopith sites being close to 4.2 million years old. Now, Bill Kimball and Charlie Lockwood, Mead Leakey, Yul Rack, and Don Johansson and I hypothesized that when we look at all these populations of East African Australopiths from 4.2 to 3 million years, what we see is a progressive increase in the number of apomorphies and suggesting this is in fact a single lineage of Australopiths. So Anamensis would have evolved into Afarensis and we can have um, taxonomic discussions around that's fine, but we do seem to see the series of changes over what is a pretty impressive number of site samples. So what does this mean? So going back to 4.2 million years, which is more than a million years earlier than Lucy, we can ask if, there, if Anamensis was already a committed biped. And the answer is pretty, pretty well, yes. We don't have a lot of fossils. If you look at apes, they have this valgus angle to the shank so that the tibia is angled outward, which allows them to position their feet against the trees as they're climbing. Whereas humans have the knee oriented right over the ankle, so the tibia is vertical, which allows us to balance over that single limb support of gait very efficiently without leaning over like the chimp does. You can measure every single hominin fossil all the way back in time to anamensis. All of them have vertical tibias, very different from what we see in any of the extant apes. So yeah, I think we're pretty confident that, uh, that anamensis would have been a committed biped. However, look at the teeth. We see some differences in the jaws and the teeth. These are two quick mandibles here. You can see that anamensis has more vertical or parallel tooth rows compared to afarensis, which is more wedged. This is a uh, the afarensis morphology increases sort of the power and, and masticatory efficiency, if you will, of the jaws. Um, the mandibular symphysis is long in anamensis and the chin is very sloping associated with this shape change. You can also see where the canine teeth are. They're pulled medially in afarensis, which is partly what gives you that V-shape of the mandible. All of these changes would enhance the chewing efficiency in afarensis compared to anamensis. So anamensis was it that accomplished a chewer as we see in afarensis. Even though the teeth or molars are a little bit bigger than apes, front teeth are a little bit smaller than apes, they're still not let what we see in afarensis and in a more extreme view in later australopiths. Oh yeah, just narrower across the front. All right, Matt Skinner and his team have been able to look at enamel thickness in all the early hominins. And anamensis over here on the left in the red circle doesn't have particularly thick enamel, unlike we see in afarensis and the later australopiths. Um, Matt Sponheimer and his team have been able to use stable isotope analysis to infer diet. And what you see is that like modern apes are, anamensis is a very restricted diet. At the bottom of the graph, here's more sort of C3 tree-based resources in general, just to oversimplify it a little. Whereas when we get to afarensis and later hominids, we see a much broader range of different foodstuffs. So there's a real dietary difference here between anamensis and afarensis. So what all of this suggests is that although anamensis may have been fully bipedal and probably fully upright, though the rest we see in the later australopiths, it's not clear that that heavy chewing adaptation evolved sort of at the same time or the rate. This is a change that evolved continuously over about the first million years since afarensis or since anamensis leading to afarensis. So we have bipedality established before we see these extreme chewing adaptations. So bipedality not only presaging, if you will, freeing the hands, making use tools and all the other things may have let us, let our ancestors um, specialize for this broad array of potential dietary choices, again, making them very successful and leading to other hominids and where we all are today. So put together, asking new questions about the origin of bipedality, why didn't we drop down to all fours to begin with, and identifying the fact that maybe diet and locomotion aren't as quite as tightly linked in the story of Australopith origins are really new sort of paradigms to take back to the fossil record and begin to answer more questions. So I'm not 
sure that I'm right yet, but I think these are hypotheses that are worth debating and thinking about and considering. And more and more data, particularly from the Miocene, more and more data from new fossils of Australopiths are really giving us a much more nuanced and probably more accurate idea of our origins. And I will stop there and say thank you all for joining me. Thank you so much to Renee for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here and I would be very happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Carol. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. Good, uh, brilliant, wonderful talk. Give us a lot of, a lot to think about. Thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, if I may, uh, we'll post some of the questions that we have here. I'd love that. First one here from, um, from SA, Robert McCarthy. Um, question is, is thorax shape uh, much different in, in life versus uh, cadaver specimens? And uh, he's wondering this uh, in terms of how much cartilage uh, change uh, with regard to, to, to the morphology here. Sure. Um, thanks for your question, Rob. Glad to be able to pipe in. Um, we, in terms of, we can look at, you know, sort of human cadavers versus, you know, they're not museum specimens. They haven't changed very much. All the soft tissues are attacked. The rib cages are attacked on all, attached on all of our animals. Um, the Animals that are eviscerated or not eviscerated aren't very different in morphology. Um, when we look at humans that have been eviscerated versus, say, scans of donors from some other project, there's not much change. So I don't suspect there's a huge amount of change. That said, when I started that project, I thought, oh, this will be easy. But it turns out that preservation issues are really a factor. And sometimes they'll be twisted a little bit to the right, a little bit to the left. So my fancy ideas of doing super duper GM analysis um, were much more complicated than we thought. Um, but overall, the differences that we see among these taxa are really large to compare to the variation we see within the tax, which is another indication of how preservation may have changed. So they may have changed some, but I don't think it's gonna change the story very much if we had the beautiful sample of live animals that we could actually scan. So I think, I feel fairly confident that we're pretty good on this one. Thank you, Carol. Now thinking about some of the earliest apes, a um, couple of questions. One, if you can comment on the, uh, one of the, ape characteristics, which is the, the loss of the tail. Um, and what can we say that in terms of the fossil record? And um, also along with along those lines about the, the, the evidence, the earliest evidence that we might have about upright posture. Um, and I think both of these will take us to the early Miocene, but um, your, your thoughts on that, please. Yeah, absolutely. Um, tail loss is one of my favorite topics. It was probably my first paper I published after my PhD, so I, maybe it was trauma or something, but <laughs> it's near and dear to my heart. We have, in terms of tail loss, we do know that at least um, the one of the earliest apes that used to be called Proconsul and now called Ikembo, we actually have the tip end of a sacrum, little tiny fossil that shows that the sacrum tapered to a, to a near point, if you will, like a human or an ape and wouldn't have supported a tail. We also see that in another middle Miocene ape called Necholopithecus. So the two out of two that we have um, have sacra that would not have supported a long tail. So we pretty feel pretty confident about that. There also have never been any caudal vertebrae of primates identified in the fossil record, at least so far. Um, uh, so I think we're pretty good on tail loss, but this means that tail loss was lost on animals that were still quadrupedal. And the earlier ideas, you know, from sort of the eighties and before, if you will, was that as, as hominoids or ape would have held their bodies upright more, the muscles that used to support the tail became um, part of the pelvic floor to support the viscera when you're in upright posture, so they're not falling out of the bottom of your pelvis. Um, that doesn't seem to be the case. The muscles of the pelvic floor are different from those of the tail. And we have falsified the hypothesis that those things are associated by finding more fossils. So why the tail is lost is a big question. We seem to see the beginning of more sort of mobile limb joints, maybe stronger grasping hands and feet in these early Miocene apes. We see that um, like lorises have lost their tail. They tend to be slow climbing. They use their grip to balance within the trees. Um, and this may have been what the early Miocene apes were doing. Jay Kelly hypothesized that they were having more abducted postures because they're fairly large and they're in the trees and you've got to support your weight on multiple branches, especially 
um, when you're on top of them. So it seems to be associated with a change, sort of a slow climbing kind of a shift for which tails, you know, tails are used for balance when you're running and leaping and so forth. That's what animals do with tails, um, that that wasn't necessary anymore and the more deliberate arboreal quadrupedalism. Um, in terms of upright body posture, it's really these later Miocene apes like Rudipithecus, Purolipithecus, Suspanopithecus, lots of pithecuses um, that seem to show evidence of upright body posture. And so they all probably would have been fairly orthograde. They also seem to have longer arms and longer curved fingers than we see in monkeys. So there seems to be sort of a vertical climbing um, suite of adaptations appearing in this radiation of European apes. And that upright posture is something that probably body posture would have probably characterized the last common ancestor of at least African apes and humans. Um, so, but that doesn't mean that they, these animals were completely specialized to those in all ways, which is sort of the, the take, I guess, that I've come to. Uh, very good. Here's a question from uh, Deborah Cunningham saying, hi, Carol, I teach paleoanthro to undergraduates and I don't give enough attention to the Miocene apes, she says. Can you recommend a reading or two on that topic that undergraduates could handle? Oh, golly. Um, yeah, that's tricky. Hi, Deb. Glad you're able to join us. Good to have you here. Um, it, it, there, Dave Begun wrote a book called Planet of the Apes that's actually not bad, and he's got a Scientific American article on Miocene, which is pretty good. Um, you may or may not remember, but my take on teaching the Miocene back in the day when I got to teach this stuff was more getting the idea of Miocene apes are not as derived as modern apes are. And which Pithecus is what is less important and desperately confusing to undergraduates. Um, I know it was to me, still is in some cases. So I think maybe that Scientific American article from Dave is probably off the top of my head, the best sort of accessible um, document, I think. And I think if you encourage them to sort of ignore some of the Pithecuses and just focus on the overall patterns, that's where I feel with it. But it would be great if there was one. I'll get I'll gear up to write an evolutionary anthropology article here soon. That would be great. Um, this is another, this is a comment rather than a question, but uh, it says here, uh, wonderful to hear your talk, Carol. Just a message from your undergraduate supervisee, Anna Nicaris, <laughs> to say it is great to hear what you're doing now. Oh, wonderful. Thanks, Anna. So good to hear from you. you just come Thanks for tuning you. in. Um, another question, Carol, just in terms of the, uh, the anatomy and what we know from the fossil record, uh, wh what would be the greatest, uh, sorry, the earliest great apes uh, that now we would call humanity, uh, but... Um, uh, well, yeah. Um, <laughs> that depends on who you ask. Um, you. Different, I, I try to remain as agnostic as humanly possible on this one. Um, because I think there's just a lot of ambiguity in the data. Um, Dave Begun would argue Rudipithecus might be that very animal. Um, other people have argued that that might in fact be sort of outside the, um, you know, gorillas in a sense. I'm not sure that we have a real consensus on exactly the very first member in the fossil record of the African ape human clade, of the hominids. And I, there are people working on this, I believe, um, that have spent a lot more time thinking about this more recently than I have. But in the literature, there's an array of different um, hypotheses. But overall, we don't need to let that get in the way of some more general conclusions because we have these radiations that seem to share at least a suite of characteristics. So I think we can still move forward somewhat with a very, very fuzzy, spidery view of, of Miocene, phylo Miocene ape phylogeny. Um, just a couple of addition, uh, additional congratulatory remarks from uh, Michelle Singleton and Senna Streams about uh, uh, an excellent talk. Thank you. Um, and Carol, could you, I, I know you didn't talk a whole lot about uh, the, the paleo environments of these uh, Miocene apes. Um, uh, is there much that we can say uh, or try to link, of course, some of these uh, adaptations to, to, to environments other than just the fact that Many of them seem to reflect life in the trees to some extent, um, but 
how can we put some of these uh, uh, discussions about uh, the, the Miocene apes in a, in a paleoenvironmental context? That's really an excellent question. And um, obviously I don't study paleo environments, but when we look at these apes in the Miocene, Rutopithecus, Rutabanya family was fairly swampy sort of environment. There wasn't a lot of satisfying ground to run around on in the first place. A lot of these Miocene apes, particularly later ones, seem to be in much more heavily forested environments, if you will. Um, so they would have been in the trees. Then of course, we have the giant gap in the African fossil record and we come back and things are much cooler and drier and more open where we find hominins. We don't find great apes there, you know, chimp and gorilla ancestors there. Presumably they retreated with the forests as far as we can tell. Um, so there does seem to be a strong paleoenvironmental um, uh, effect, I guess, on the transition from sort of these Miocene arboreal apes to something that would have been more terrestrial and able to exploit these more open environments. And clearly chimps and gorillas spend quite a bit of time on the ground, partly because there's not this continuous canopies that they're living in for the most part that enable them to just stay up there like orangutans and gibbons. Well, we're making it, making that more challenging as time goes on, but traditionally have been able to do. So there's a, there's a strong environmental component to all of this, I think. And still in the late Miocene, uh, would you consider the using Bernard Wood's expression of possible hominins, um, Artipithecus, uh, Kadaba, um, Auroran, and Sahelanthropus hominins based on what we know about their postcrania? I think, given the fact that they would be hominins if they're more closely related to us than they are to chimpanzees. And I think there's some data for that, particularly Artipithecus, which is of course much better represented. There are pelvic characters, there are cranial base characters that um, show a shortened cranial base, a broad lower part of the pelvis. These are features we only see in, in hominins among hominoids. So those seem to be some good characters that will link these phylogenetically. Um, Sahelanthropus, seems to have some features as it does Aurora and also that might link them with hominins in terms of canine reduction, other things. So there seems to be characters that would suggest that would be likely synapomorphies that we see with hominins. So I think that they certainly could be placed within the hominin clade, whether they don't seem to have been, well, we can't really tell for, um, for especially for Hesahelanthropus, committed bipeds in the way that Australopithecus was. They may have been facultative bipeds or somewhere in between that seems to be if you want a sort of explanation that's so broad, it's unsatisfying um, as much as we can say, at least. Um, there's, you know, Artipithecus has a grasping big toe. That's a pretty different thing. You've retained that ability to go in the trees. So these seem to be, if they're bipedal, they're some sort of incipient facultative kind of um, terrestrial bipedality, I would say. They're, again, back to the environment. For example, um, in East Africa, you don't have this dense, forested areas where those animals were found. So you're not, there weren't been able to be, there weren't trees large enough to support above branch quadrupeds kind of, of that size in East Africa at that time also. So clearly these animals would have been on the ground, perhaps partly bipedal. There doesn't seem any sort of obvious, you know, quadrupedal print in them anyway. So I would suggest that they're hominins, just not completely specialized for terrestrial bipedality. And moving ahead in time, chronologically uh, a bit, you've mentioned Artipithecus, of course. Um, what can we say about the relationship between Artipithecus ramidus and your beloved Australopithecus anamensis? Well, um, stay tuned on that for upcoming papers, but it's possible as ramidus is, um, found a slightly more gona or slightly more recent than the original um, publicated but by 4.3 or so. We have anamensis that are back to about 4.2. So these are very, very close in time and they're very different sorts of animals. So I think it's very unlikely that you have ramidus evolving into afarensis just based on the temporal distribution of these fossils. Um, in addition to the morphology. Um, interestingly, we also have that foot from Bertelli in Ethiopia, which has a grasping big, big toe, but we have no idea what, it's just a foot. So we don't have any craniodental remains associated that looks very much like Artipithecus. So it's possible if that 
if Bertelli is related to Artie, that you would have an Australopithecus Artipithecus coexisting for even some time. But well, more definitely not more fossil evidence to test anything like that. And uh, with, with the early hominin fossil record, Carol, we, we, we do tend to assign all of these early, uh, um, let's see, early um, hominoids or hominids to the hominin lineage. Um, is it possible, possible that any of these early hominoids or hominins could be in, in, in the chimpanzee or gorilla line uh, rather than hominin lineage? Gosh, I wish I could say heck yeah, there's a great fossil record of African apes. That would, that's the find, that's what you want. You don't want fossil hominids, you want fossil great apes. Um, there may be some chimp teeth from maybe 500,000 years ago from Baringo. There's some 10 million year old teeth from Ethiopia that have been suggested to be perhaps representing a gorilla lineage, but there's nothing else in the fossil record that has any apomorphies of chimps or gorillas that we can identify. And all of these things we're calling hominins share characters with other hominins and humans that we don't see in chimps or gorillas when they have, when they have apomorphies. So unfortunately, I don't think so. I wish we could. It'd be super sweet. And another question, you've, you've described the, the Australopithecus uh, body then as fairly human-like in some ways. Um, would you say this is consistent with what we know about Australopithecus from the cranial dental uh, morphology? Are, are these pretty much in line with what they would tell us about uh, the overall paleobiology of Australopithecus? That's a good question. So I think that the evidence is fairly compelling that the body, they would have, Australopithecus would have fully upright and a fairly human-like body, probably stockier and certainly more muscular than we are and so on and so forth. There may be some differences and upper limb morphology here and there, but basically a similar plan um, that seems to fit with what we see in the cranial base and the reorganization of the frame and magnum and associated structures in the cranial base. Um, the one thing we don't really understand very well about Australopithecus is its neck posture. For example, you know, or gibbons are very orthograde, but their necks are sort of cantilevered anteriorly, if you will. They don't have that nice curvature that ours do, that lordosis. That unfortunately is super elusive in terms of bones. You can look at modern people and vertebral shape doesn't really have much to do with how much of a lordosis you have. Um, my former student, recent graduate, Faye McGeechee, who's now a postdoc with Zarai Elam Seged at University of Chicago, has been looking at modern animals trying to get a look at nuchal morphology and musculature to see if she can find differences associated with head and neck posture, then then come back to the fossil, to the osteologic correlates. She's done the muscle work. She's working on the rest of it. So we're hoping that that'll get some insights. We're starting to get a few more fossils of, verte of cervical vertebrae. Um, so from Australopithecus in Eastern and Southern Africa, so maybe we'll have a better idea of that. But overall, I don't think there's anything to contradict that. And we certainly see the lower limb adaptations associated with bipedal, bipedal posture and locomotion as well. Great. Uh, another question from one of our uh, listeners. Uh, is bipedalism somehow connected to the loss of body hair? Uh, or is this rather recent in our evolution? Well, um, based on the fossil record, we have absolutely no idea. <laughs> um, you know, all other hominoids but us have much more body hair than we do. We also have ever growing hair on the tops of our heads and, um, and so forth. Um, we don't have really any, there's no fossil record of that. We need to find a great Lagerstatten style preservation with Australopithecus smashed in the mud and then we can see some hair imprints or not. Um, so it's really hard to say. There have been a number of hypotheses. If you're walking you know, outside, you need better thermal regulation and sweating and you lose body hair. And a lot of these are plausible, but there's just no way that the fossil record is able to tackle that at this point. Maybe if we're able to get you know, genetic material, we could look for something, but I don't think that's super likely. We may or may not be able to get proteins, but that probably won't have enough um, information to get at it in terms of molecular data. So I think until we get that great Australopithecus preserved in the mud, we're gonna be out of luck for being able to tell.
we'll, we'll keep looking for it. Yes. Uh, well, thank you, Carol. I think that's all the questions that we have here. Um, and thank you very much for taking the time to talk with us. And thank you to all of those of you who uh, sent us questions. It's great to have those. And uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was a great talk. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I look forward to seeing you again in the field sometime and uh, in the Lake Turkana uh, Basin sometime, I hope in the not too distant future, Carol, but we really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today. Thank you so much for having me and thank you everybody who listened on your great questions. Um, it's really fun to have a chance to talk about all of this and I appreciate your time. And uh, I also hope to see you in the field very soon, Renee, somehow. Thank great. you. Thank you.